Patron Saints of Nothing, page 51, Things Inside, 4 March 2012, Dear Kuya J, I decided I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. We learned about the planets today in science class, and I wish I could see them for myself, even though most everyone wants to visit Saturn because of its rings. I would fly to Jupiter. Did you know it has a storm that is thousands of kilometers in diameter that has been going on for hundreds of years? If I could go into the middle without being killed, I think that would be so beautiful to see. And if I got bored, I could go to one of its many moons. The teacher said one of them has water, and where there is water, there will be Filipinos. I told Tate at dinner, and he said it was stupid, but everyone knows the Philippines it has no space program. Maybe it will one day, I said. Then I pointed out how we were some of the first people to cross the oceans, so why couldn't we be among the first to cross space? He shook his head and said I had been watching too many American movies. The Philippines will never have a space program, he said. When I told him that I will move to a country that has one, he said no, that I was born here, and I would die here. After dinner, Grace told me she did not think my idea was stupid. She said she would like to visit Neptune, but when I told her how cold Neptune is, she switched her answer to Venus. It is fun to dream about, but I think Tate is right, so maybe you could become the astronaut instead, and if you're a very good astronaut, maybe they'll let you take someone along and you could choose me. We could go to Jupiter. We could go wherever you want. Anywhere but this planet. Sincerely. June. I'm on the floor next to my bed reading one of June's letters after dinner, still in disbelief that my parents have agreed to let me go on the trip, and there's a knock on my door. Can I come in? Dad says from the other side. I put the letter away and slide the box back under my bed, wondering if he's here because they've changed their mind. Sure. Dad enters, pushes aside some clothes draped over my desk chair, and takes a seat. He leans back and looks around. I wait for him to say something. Finally, he points with his lips at the poster of Alan Iverson on the wall above my bed. One of the very few recognizable Filipino habits he's retained. That's new, yes? I shake my head. Iverson's still wearing a Sixers jersey in the picture. He used to be June's and my favorite player. Oh, he says. He looks around. Taps the statue of the Forsaken Queen from World of Warcraft. It's on my desk. This is, right? Sure, I say, even though it was a Christmas gift from him and Mom three years ago. Another thing shaded with June's ghost, because when we were in middle school, he snuck out to an internet cafe so we could play online together a few times. He was terrible, of course, but I didn't care. I knew it. Dad goes back to letting his gaze wander, and I go back to waiting for him to say why he's here. Eventually, I can't take it anymore. So what's up, Dad? What's up, he repeats. It's a very American phrase, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so. You're very American, like your mother. No accent like me. I shrug. So I moved us here. I wanted you, your brother, and your sister to be American. Mission accomplished. I draw my knees to my chest, seeing this for what it is. You may not speak Tagalog or know as much as you would like about the Philippines, but if we'd stayed, you wouldn't have had all the opportunities that you had here. I don't say anything, but I wonder if June would still be alive if our family had remained, or if his family had joined us in the U.S. It's easy to romanticize a place when it's far away, he goes on making this officially the most I've heard him speak at once in a long time. Filipino-Americans have a tendency to do that. Even me, sometimes I miss it so much. The beaches, the water, the rice paddies, the carabao, the food, most of all my family. He closes his eyes, and I wonder if he's imagining himself there right now. After a few moments, he opens them again, but he stares at his hands. But as many good things as there are, there are many bad things, things not so easy to see from far away. When you are close, though, they are sometimes all you see. I want to, tell, want to tell him that I understand, but I don't, because I don't. Instead, I ask, like what? Just be careful and keep that in mind, is all he says, rising to leave. I forwarded the flight info to your email. You'll be there for ten days. You'll spend three with Tito Manning, three with Tita Chato, three with your Lolo and Lola, and then one more with Tito Manning, since he'll take you back to the airport. What about Tito Danilo, I ask? He was assigned to a parish in Bicol a few years ago, so you'll see him when we were with your Lolo and Lola. Thank you, Dad, I say. I really do appreciate it. He stops in the doorway. But, Jason, you must promise me one thing. I know, I say. Stay with family at all times. But yes, but that's not what I was going to say. You must promise not to bring up your cousin while you're there. It will be too painful to them. Too shameful. They won't forget to move on. Honor that. Of course, Dad, I say. No problem. He searches my face for the truth. Satisfied, he nods and leaves. I may not have learned to speak my native language from him, but I learned to keep the most important things inside. Page 56. <clears throat> like a fog. 
I stay home from school again on Wednesday to prepare for a trip that does not feel real. I message my teachers to let them know I'll be out and ask for work, and then I make a checklist of all that I need to bring. I select books, charge my electronics, and download music, TV shows, and movies into my phone for the long-ass plane ride. I text Seth to let him know what's up. I DM June's friend again, but he's still MIA. When Dad comes home from work, his car is loaded with stuff he picked up from Costco. I help him unload everything. Pasluban for the Balik Bayan boxes, he explains. Huh? Pasluban. Gifts for the family. Balik Bayan. One returning home. I nod, vaguely remembering this happening before our last trip to the Philippines. He sets up two cardboard boxes in the living room and lays out everything he bought. Clothing, medicine, toiletry, spam, ginormous tins of coffee, toys, school supplies, and a couple pairs of shoes, and more. No, it's all going to fit in two of those boxes. He starts methodically filling the first one, and I wander over and start with the second. He keeps glancing over and frowning. After a couple minutes, he stops what he's doing and tells me, like this, he gestures towards his box. You need to put the heavier stuff on the bottom. Oh, I begin unpacking everything and start over, ashamed. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Will you get the scale, please? I back away and let Dad finish. After both boxes are full, Dad weighs them. One is a bit over and the other a li little under the 50-pound limit. So he swaps a few items until both are good to go. He then tapes them shut, writes Tito Manning's address on the sides in large letters with permanent marker, and binds them with nylon rope for good measure. He pats one and says, For Manning and Chato. And the other, For Danilo and your Lolo and Lola. When I think I'm finished packing my suitcase, Mom comes in and makes me run through my checklist with her to ensure I have everything. It's all there, but I can't shake the feeling that I'm forgetting something important. After she says goodnight, I pull June's letter from the box, bind them with a thick rubber band, and shove them inside my backpack. It takes me a long time to fall asleep. When I do, I dream what I think is a memory. I'm 10 and back in the Philippines. I spent the day at school with June, and now we are walking back to his house. Everyone's wearing the slacks and short sleeve barong of their school uniform. Even me, since I borrowed June's clothes. We're laughing because one of his classmates looks like a giraffe when he sticks out his neck. Then everyone goes their separate ways at an intersection. I try to follow June, but he tells me I can't and picks up his pace. I try to follow him through the afternoon streets, which are crowded with people and cars and jeepneys and motorcycles. Not long before I lose him. We arrive at the airport in a pre-dawn hush. My parents wait with me in a long line of Filipinos, each bearing their own balik bayan boxes. When it's my turn to check in and my boxes get weighed and tossed onto the conveyor belt, it strikes me that even though Dad took care of them up until now, I'll have to claim the boxes by myself in Manila. It'll be my responsibility. I hug my parents. Dad holds on to me longer than I expect, and when we separate, it looks like he's about to say something that stops himself. I say goodbye and head through security without looking back, relieved to be on my own at last, but also feeling kind of adrift, thinking about my long journey ahead. Detroit to South Korea, then South Korea to Manila. Almost 20 hours in all. My flight is one of the first of the day, so the airport is still waking up. The terminal's halls are filled with bright fluorescent light, but more workers than passengers. Most of the shops and newsstands are closed. The only place with the line is Dunkin' Donuts. I find a seat right next to my gate. Through the windows, I watch the crew get comfortable in the cockpit. The flight attendants start to prep the plane. The handlers load the luggage into the cargo hold, my boxes somewhere in there. The sky lightens with the clouds. I can't distinguish east from west. The gate gradually fills with people until it's standing room only. As we begin to board, the knot my stomach tightens. As I make my way down the ramp onto the plane and into my seat, June's ghost follows like a fog. <clears throat> Chapter, page 60, The Strength of My Conviction. I wake up certain I'm about to die because an alarm is blaring in my ears. But when my eyes fly open, nobody else is panicking. All of the other passengers are sleeping or reading or talking softly. But the alarm is still blasting, a shrill, urgent pulse drilling into my brain. Finally, I realize the sound is coming from my headphones. It's some sound effect in the movie I fell asleep watching. I tap pause on the seat back screen and the alarm is immediately silenced. I laugh to myself and flip off my headphones, relieved I am not about to die. I stretch in my seat a bit and rub my eyes, then I navigate to the flight map. The little plane symbol is partway across the Pacific Ocean. Four more hours to Seoul where I have a layover, and then, for the first time in almost eight years, I'll be in Manila. No parents or brother or sister. Just me. 
Try to look out the window, but I can't see much from my middle seat except for the blue of the sky. An old Filipino man sits in the window seat to my left. He's staring straight ahead with his eyes open, but his screen is blank. This is the same position he was in when I fell asleep, making me wonder at his ability to do nothing for hours on end. No book, no in-flight movies, no small talk. Just a rosary, rosary clutched in his hands. Maybe he's sleeping with his eyes open. Dude does look pretty old, so I guess he could be thinking back on his life. Middle-aged white woman was to my right, the kind who seems like she probably posts a lot of photos of herself doing yoga on social media alongside inspirational quotes. But her seat's empty at the moment. I consider resuming a movie or playing some game, but I don't really feel like doing either. I cycle through some of the available TV shows and movies, but the only thing that catches my attention is Hitch, starring Will Smith. Hit play, even though I've already seen it. I've seen all of Will Smith's films since Chris was obsessed with the guy when we were growing up. According to my brother, the first Bad Boys is the man's finest work, followed closely by Independence Day. It's mostly downhill from there. If you tell Chris After Earth is a great film, he will slap you, even though he saw it on opening day. It's not too long before Hitch loses my attention. I dig through my bag and pull out June's letters. I've gone back and started rereading them chronologically, so I take out the next one. I lower the tray table, smooth the paper flat, and take a deep breath. I read, 29 September 2013, Dear Jai, Did you know that if you eat mango and chocolate, you'll have to go to the bathroom so much? It is true. Just ask Grace. Sorry if that was a gross way to begin my letter, but I thought you might find it interesting. It would also be useful to know if you're ever having trouble with your bowel movements. Anyway, I need you to tell about you about this thing that happened yesterday after Mass that is bothering me. Our family went to the mall, the big one we took you to when you were here. The driver dropped us off in the front of the entrance like normal. It was very crowded, and as we walked through the door, this woman approached us. She was very dirty and smelled bad, like all the other street people who beg. Except instead of holding out her palms for some coins, she held out something to my nene. First, I thought it was just a bag or a bundle of rags, and I wondered why she would be trying to give that to nene. But then I looked closer and saw it was a baby. Kuyajai, a baby. Except it did not look like any baby I had seen before. It was so thin, and its skin was a weird color. Not really pale, but almost. Closer to gray, maybe. Anyway, it could not have been more than a few weeks old. It was not even crying. Please, man, the woman said, and then coughed a few times. My nene kept walking. Everyone in my family kept walking. Everyone around us kept walking as if this woman were a ghost. As if she did not exist. Except for me, Kuya. I stopped and looked at the woman's face. Her eyes were yellow. Her cheeks were hollow. Her teeth were crooked and incomplete. She held out her baby to me. Please said again. I reached to take the child, but then a hand clamped my arm and dragged me away, away from the woman, past the security guard, through the open glass doors, and into the mall. In a flash, the woman was gone, replaced with the bright lights and bright smells of a thousand stores. Stay with us, Tate said to me, still dragging me to catch up with my sisters, and then a hurting my arm. That woman, I said, what about her, he said. She was trying to give me her baby. What were you going to do, eh? Raise it? He laughed. I thought of the sermon we had just heard a mass that morning. It was about the Good Samaritan. You know the one? I think everyone does. At least everyone has heard it. Every time I do, I think surely if I were in that situation, I would be like the Samaritan and help the man in need. But how many times have I instead walked past? So I did not say anything to you. I stayed silent. I let Tate drag me through the crowds of shoppers until we rejoined Nene and Grace and Angel. When he finally let me go, I did not try to return her. I cannot stop thinking about that woman and her baby. I feel like I should have taken her baby and given it to an orphanage or something. I told Grace this later, but she said there was nothing I, I could do, that I'm too young to take care of a child. She also said there are probably millions of children that need to be taken care of, and even if I was old enough, I could not take care of them all. Even though she is young, I know she is right. That makes me feel like my chest is hollow. But it seems to me that there are so many older than us who are able to take care of those in need. If everyone did a little bit, then everyone would be okay, I think. Instead, most people do nothing, and that is the problem. Does that make sense, Kuya? Anyway, I hope to hear from you soon. It has been a few months since your last letter. I don't know how you were doing, if you ever beat that video game that was giving you so much trouble. Sincerely, June. I feel a hand lightly touch my right arm. It was the woman in the aisle seat, back from the bathroom, or wherever she was. Are you okay, she asks, her face colored with concern. I blink and find my eyes are brimming with tears. I sit up, wipe them away with my hoodie sleeve, and clear my throat. Oh, um, yeah, I'm okay. It's just the movie. I point at the screen. It's really sad. The woman's eyes follow my finger. We both watch as Will Smith tries to teach, teach that stocky white guy how to dance. It does not go well. In Seoul, my connecting flight's been delayed. I'm sitting on the floor because there are too many people and not enough seats at the gate. But it's okay because South Korea is apparently decades ahead of the rest of the world. 
This place is as bright and as clean as a spaceship in an optimistic sci-fi film. There are outlets and USB ports everywhere you look. There are computers and touchscreens set up throughout the terminal with free internet access. But most impressively, the toilets have these sci-fi doors that slide out of the wall with the push of a button. When you grow up in a country like the United States, you're constantly told it's the greatest place in the world. But then you go somewhere else one day and find out that bathroom doors like this exist, and you start to question everything. But adults lie, I guess. That's what they do. Sure, there are a bunch of reasons they do it, and people would probably say most of them are pretty good. When you're a kid, they lie and say you did a great job in a game, even if you sucked. Then you grow up a bit, and your mom and dad lie to you about how strong the relationship is and how much they love each other after they have a big fight. You grow up a bit more and they tell you that life is a lie that life is as simple as studying hard, getting into a good college, finding a decent job. Sometimes I feel like growing up is slowly peeling back these layers of lies. The truth of what happened to June is under there somewhere, and its burial seems increasingly intentional the more I think about it. Since Tito Manning's a big deal in the police force, it wouldn't have reflected well on him if his son was murdered as part of the drug war. I'm sure he has all kinds of connections, so maybe he leveraged one of them to keep June's name out of the press. Who knows what else he's hidden. I pull my bag closer and shift to a more comfortable position, then put up my head and close my eyes. I turn up the volume of my music to drown out the airport crowd, and I imagine the moment when Tito Manning will pick me up from the airport. Standing straight, I'll greet him, look him in the eye, and then ask him point blank how his son died. I will not look away or be intimidated or be silent. I'm not a little boy anymore. I will hold his gaze until he gives me an answer, and if he lies, I will demand the truth. Like a tree in the wind, he will bend before the strength of my conviction.